I'm going to be turning there, Philippians chapter 4. Um, back in 1983, long time ago, many moons ago, I lost my first wife to darkness. And part of that darkness was my own darkness. And I was so wounded and so hurt, I wanted to end my life. I wanted to die. But God took me by the hand. And he took me to a church. And in that church, I was nourished. And I was taken care of. And I was helped. And as time went on, I gained strength. And I continued to grow and look at the word of God and fellowship with fellow believers. And I received so much for years. And then, of course, you all know why God remarried and now we've had five children and it's been wonderful it's been wonderful but the church was a major major part of that and since then as a pastor I've gone through many situations where people are very very wounded I've had uh, women that have been sexually abused as children and they've come to realize what has happened and they come to my office and sometimes they can't even talk they're so hurt and confused and angry. They can't even talk. And with all confidence, I'm able to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And with all confidence, I'm able to tell them there are resources here at Living Word to help. And there's been men that have done terrible, terrible things. And they feel so ashamed. They, they don't want anybody to know. And with all confidence, I'm able to turn them to the Lord Jesus Christ and to know and to tell them there are resources here that we can be of help. Divorces many times. And I know with all confidence because God has been at work all these years, for centuries, for hundreds and thousands of years. And we are a part of that work of God. So I, I'm, I'm very confident, though I've passed through so much, and I suspect I'm going to go through more. But because of God's work, and God's work through his body, the church, there is great, great confidence. But as with any other group, you know, there has to be uh, teamwork. I remember, some of you may not like it, but 2014, the NBA champions were the San Antonio Spurs. <laughs> And the following year, as the years of the month went by, what was highlighted was the Spurs teamwork. They passed the ball and they helped each other and they won the championship. And that's the way it's supposed to be, teamwork. But it's not just any professional football, it happens in business. When the employees look out for the company and the company looks out for the employees, guess what? They're very, very effective. In a family, it's the same way. When the children support the parents and the parents love the children and the husband and wife work together good, guess what? That family's going to be awesome. You know? But it takes that, that teamwork working together to be effective, to be successful. And it's the same way in the church. We have to work together. And over the years, I personally uh, have been greatly encouraged. We started this church in 1987, meaning uh, 2017. Next year of October will be 30 years since we started. And in those years, I've been greatly encouraged over and over again by the support that you have given to Living Word through hard times. Uh, sometimes we've had to say, you know what? We don't have the money. We're going to only pay the interest on our building because that's all we can do. And then we catch up and we've gone back and like, wow. Some of you might remember Mike Hutchison. And he gave a testimony how he was amazed, amazed at God's work through Living Word and how God comes through. We lost Mike last year, right? 
and his he lives with us so to speak but he was very very encouraging and he was encouraged himself how the Lord has worked through you through living word but you know sometimes it's good to go back and review the reasons why we do the things that we do why church anyway you see it's good to go back and, and, and see why. Now, I want you to turn to Matthew 16. You want to keep your place in Philippians 4. We'll get there. But just uh, look at Matthew 16. Because this is God's work. Uh, I have quite a bit of education. Uh, I've read a lot of books. And I've read a lot of books on how to help people. Uh, through divorce, through their anger issues, through loneliness, through what have you. Many, many psychological books. And there's nothing, nothing, not even close compared to the Word of God and the church, the body of Christ. And I want you to note here, in John, uh, Matthew 16, Jesus Christ took his disciples and he took them to this place where there was a massive cliff and in that cliff, there was little niches carved out, and there were different gods that were represented. And people would go to this place and worship their god, their favorite god. And Jesus took them to this place, Caesarea Philippi, and he asked the disciples. So just know, Jesus is take, okay, in comparison to all these gods and what people think, he took them there, John, uh, Matthew 16, and verse 16, or verse 13, let's say, Matthew 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, remember, that's where all the gods were, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who do people say that I am? I.e., in comparison to all these gods. Verse 14, and they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say? that I am. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the promised Messiah from centuries back. In fact, you're not just the Messiah, you're God, you're the son of God. Uh, verse 17, and Jesus answered to him, blessed are you Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. This is God's work, my father's work. And I also, I'm also working. And I also uh, say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, look at this, upon this rock I'm going to build my church. And the gates of Hades, of hell, will not prevail against it. Meaning, the gates of hell, metaphorically speaking, uh, hell has gates. That church is going to be so powerful that it's going to break through those gates and preach the gospel and grab some people from hell, so to speak. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. And the church has the gospel, has the means by which to help people out of darkness. You see, it's the church of Christ. And you and I are called to be a part of that church. You see. And that's why I'm sold out. And I can tell you with all confidence. That Jesus Christ has provided everything we need for life and godliness. The question is are you part of it or not? Did you note in the reading. In Ephesians chapter 4 where our brother read. I turned there again. Ephesians chapter 4. Just want to point out a couple of things as where he read. Um, verse 11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. So God has gifted the church with people to equip the members to do the ministry. It's not just the professionals. No, it's the members. And every member has a gift, and every member is supposed to be involved in the church. And what is the church? 
God's agency to help people out of darkness. It's not the welfare system of the United States. It's not the health care system of the United States. It's not the government. It's the church. And God has gifted the church to equip the saints for a work of service. Uh, and what does he want? Verse 13, he wants unity, right? Verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse, uh, yeah, verse 13, until they all attain to the unity. What did I say about the Spurs? What did I say about a family? What did I say about a, uh, a business? The more effectively they work together, then the more they're going to be successful in accomplishing what they're supposed to accomplish. And what's the, the church to be about? Helping people out of darkness. I'm going to build my church to address the, the darkness that people are in, to bring them out. And all of us have friends. You young people, junior high, high school, you know the mess up. You know how young your fellow students, some of them, are. their homes are all busted up. They're so confused. They're hurting. They're cutting themselves. They're giving their bodies away just to get some attention. You know what it's like. And they're all messed up. And no one's there to help them. Well, God has said, I'm giving, I've built my church. And the members are to be equipped and work together to be successful in bringing people out of darkness. I want you to jump down to verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 4. From whom the whole body being fitted together and held together by what every joint supplies. You see that? I'm not making it up. By what every joint supplies. See, we're to be working together. Where are you? Where are you this morning? Are you connected to the church? Doesn't have to be living word. It can be whatever church you want to. I tell people, you know, if you don't like this church, that's okay. Go to another church, but be connected. I just said, you just want to ask a few questions. Uh, are they preaching the word of God? Uh, are you learning the scriptures? Is there a, a real concentration on God, not self? Is there good community within that church? You see, are they, are they reaching others? But still, if it's not the church somewhere, but connect to the church of Jesus Christ. Where are you? Maybe you're just trying to survive, man. Because life is a witch. I used to W. <laughs> it's hard. And uh, we have to be careful. But are you connected or you're just trying to survive in life? Just trying to keep your, water, your nose above water. How's your Christian walk? Are you wanting to connect to the church, but something keeps you? What is that? What is that? You see, the church is God's agency, and he wants you and me to be a part of it. It's not a, you know, once in a great while, maybe even just, okay, once a Sunday is be enough. It's not about being at church. It's, uh, being at church is being church. See, wherever you're at, to live the Christian life and be connected to what God is doing. Now, in such a time as ours, it can be very discouraging, especially for our young people again. They see much hypocrisy. They see the materialism. They see the focus is on work, 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 and no relationship. Uh, many times, the young people are very discouraged. So they get all the new stuff. They get all the whatever, all the material goods, but there's an emptiness in relationship. And they say, what is all this waste of time? You see? It's a waste of time. So we need to go back and review why church anyway? You see? So back in Philippians then, Philippians chapter 4, this is the end of the of the letter to the Philippians and what Paul has been saying throughout, the gospel, throughout, throughout Philippians is like, look man, when we work together 
in gospel work, in gospel teams, that we're effective, there's joy, there are rewards, God gets glory. I mean, life is worth being lived for Christ when we work together. But again, we live in times where we're so scared of each other. We're a one-man show. We're going to do it ourselves. Thank you very much. I got all the expertise. I got all the money. I don't need you. Thank you. Not good. Not good. So in Philippians chapter 4, I'm gonna, we're going to be covering from verse 10 to 20, 10 verses. And the Apostle Paul is ending this letter here. And uh, I break it up. Verses 10 through 14... Uh, encouragement in God-dependent gospel team work. Encouragement when we are a team working together. And then verses 15 through 18, there's faithfulness. When we are faithful, then there's a payoff. There's a payoff. Some of you know if you're retired and you've been faithful in putting away. Okay, now that you're retired, you know it's, been, it's a payoff. Because all those years you were putting away, and now you can retire. But there's something much greater than just retirement. It's God and his kingdom, you see. And what we find in verses uh, 15 through 18, faithfulness to gospel work pays off. And finally, verses 19 through 20, it needs to be God-centered. It needs to be God-centered, not self-centered. All right? So first of all then, let me read the passage. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. But I rejoiced. In the Lord greatly, now that at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm, I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. In my affliction. Note that. In verse 15 following. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once to my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am ampl amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God-dependent gospel work. We need to be partnering and it's God-centered. It produces joy and glory to God. It produces eternal life. It produces what we all long for. You know, as a, as, a, as a young boy, you can say, you know, man, if I had that toy, and when I have that toy, oh, I'm happy. <laughs> and as we get older, we've gotten bigger and bigger toys. But what we're wanting really deep down in our soul is satisfaction and joy. You see, we, it's still the same, right? Well, here, what the Apostle Paul is saying, listen. What fulfills and brings you joy now and forever is God and his work. So be a part of God's work. And so he says, um, first of all, there's great encouragement when you're part of a team. And so that's what he starts off with in verse 10. Um, there is rejoicing. And uh, when Paul says, man, I rejoice in the Lord. Notice it says, in the Lord. That's very important because that means in God's work. In God's work because it can get very confusing. Oh, I'm encouraged that you sent me money. Oh, that money encouraged me. That money encouraged me. No, what Paul is saying, I rejoice greatly in the Lord, in the work of God. And you're a part of that. 
in that you send me money. You, you got concerned to get in a fresh way. Paul had been to Philippi a number of times. And now, back then, they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have email. They didn't, it was, you know, they didn't even have snail mail. I mean, you know, so by the time that he visited, it might have been six months later that he got the news or gift or whatever. So he's saying, look, uh, it's so good to have you concerned about me again. Uh, we can all can identify with that at some point because we can go on and on and on and finally somebody gives us a call and say, hey, how are you? Somebody cares? <laughs> Somebody cares? Yeah, I, I, you were having trouble with your whatever, business, your spouse, your children. How, how are things going? Like, somebody cares. Wow. And Paul says, man, Philippians, you revived your care for me again. It's not that you didn't care, but now you lacked an opportunity. And, and there's come here and you send the gift. But Paul wants to make it very clear. Listen, it's not that I'm dependent on you. That's not the point. Ultimately, I'm dependent on the Lord. You see? For now he wants to clarify, right? In verse 11. Not that I speak from want. I'm not begging you. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. And that's very important within the church. That it's not we ask for money because, oh man, we're, oh. No. This is God's work. And so when I stand up here once a year or twice a year and say, look, man, you got to give money. It's not that, oh, man, I'm, you know, nervous. God, the whole world belongs to God. You know? So it's not, Paul is saying, it's not that I'm begging you, man. That's not it. Because I've learned to be okay in all circumstances. You see? Have you gotten to that point where you're okay? And then he spells it out a little bit more. Because we all need to have it spelled out a little bit more. <laughs> Verse 12. I know how to get along with humble means. And I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. Both of having an abundance and having need. You know what? It's going to be okay. I want that new. But if I don't get that new, it's okay. I want to be respected by my spouse. But when it doesn't happen, I know how to be. It's okay. I want to be loved by my spouse. When it's not, it's going to be okay. You see? I want my children to obey. But when they don't, it's going to be okay. I don't have to go crazy. I know. I want to have a steak. But if all I have crackers, I'm fine. I mean, we can go on and on and on. And in the Christian life, that's what we need. And the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm rejoicing greatly in the Lord because I see the hand of God, the work of God continuing, helping people. And you Philippians have been a part of this. And I can tell you, as a pastor, I've been many times, many times encouraged but by what you all do, support Living Word. And some of you supported my wife and I directly, have given us gifts. I can, I can name and point to a number of you that have blessed us beyond measure. And I've been greatly encouraged. Not that I, we're okay if it didn't happen, you see, because the Lord sustains us. You see? And that's what the Apostle Paul said. I've learned how to, on both I, I've been treated to, to, to a cruise, my wife and I. And it just hit me up beside the head. And like, wow, where did that come from? And I, whoo, we enjoyed it, didn't we? It was just it was lovely. It was great. You know, uh, I've been sent to Israel. Uh, this friend told me, I was sent to Israel. You're crazy. And we just kept having lunch. He said, no, look it up. Shut up. Kept eating. He brought up the third time. I was like, you're serious? Yes, I'm serious. Like, wow. And there's other times that I've been so lonely and hurt. I want to quit. No. I learned how to be okay. That the Lord is my all-sufficiency. And so, 
when I come up here and ask that you need to be supporting the church, it's not that I, I, I'm begging or anything. It's God's work. And when I see God's work, it's just awesome. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. And now in verse 13, people have read this passage and they misquote it, they misapply it all over the place. Right? I can do all things through Christ, through Christ who strengthens me. Meaning, I'm going to make this company make a million dollars. I can do all things through Christ. Right? Meaning, I'm going to heal somebody because I can do all things in Christ's name. You have cancer in Jesus' name and we're going to do it. I mean, that's not what he's talking about there. What is he talking about? That he can do okay whether he's hungry or where he's prosperity. He's going to be walking with God. That's what he's talking about. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Got to read the context there. Where people misuse this passage all the time. And then he goes back to the Philippians. The Philippians, you know what? It's good that you are sharing with me that word. Um, nevertheless, you have done well to share, S-H-A-R-E, uh, but in the Greek, it's a long word. <laughs> it's um, together fellowshipping. I don't know why they just added, you know, preposition in front and they connected it. It's a huge word like this. But, you know, as you look it up and what he's talking about, he says, you're fellowshipping with me in my afflictions. Why afflictions? And I want you to go back all the way to the beginning of Philippians chapter 1, the beginning of the book. And he uses the very, very same long Greek word um, in verse 7. Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. For it was only right for me to feel this way about you uh, all because you have, uh, you have, I have you in my prayers, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers. Same long word. You are fellowshipping with me. You are partaking in my suffering, in my imprisonment, in all that I'm going through. You're partnering with me. You see? We are working together. We are a team. And that's what he's saying. Look at verse 5 of chapter 1. Um, in view of your participation. There it is again. Fellowship in koinonia. In the gospel from the first day until now. And that's what Paul is rejoicing in. That the Philippians are working together with him. For what? To share the gospel. And what is the gospel? It's the power of God to bring people out of hell. And take them to heaven forever and ever. That's the gospel. And Paul is saying you are part of this. You've done well to be a part of what God is doing. You see? And he say, man, I'm so encouraged. Back again, verse, chapter 4, and verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord. And when you, each one of you, are part of what God is doing, you too can experience that, oh man, this is great. But if not, then you're going to turn to Walmart. You're going to turn to Red Lobster. You're going to turn to whatever, and that's it. Nothing that's going to last. You see, it's God and his kingdom that lasts and bring lasting joy. And that's what Paul, the Apostle Paul is saying. Man, I, I rejoice greatly. You did well, Philippians, to, to support me in this, in my afflictions, you see, in my sufferings for the gospel. And now he goes on, he says, you know what? You've been faithful, and that faithfulness pays off. That faithfulness pays off. Because now he starts to start in verse 15. Uh, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. And even in Thessalonica, you sent several times. You sent support for me. You've been faithful. You've been faithful. And some of us have been giving. But we forget, 
or we leave it aside, or we don't give as much. And Paul is kind of reminding them, hey, you've been faithful. Stay faithful. Because why? Because being faithful to the work of God pays off. Pays off. Look what he's saying again in verse 17. Once again, he wants to remind them, it's not about me, guys. It's not about giving money to me, the apostle Paul says. But look what he says. Very, very interesting. Verse 17. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. What the words he talking about? He's talking about rewards that God, and you know, we're all multi-motivational. We want to escape judgment, yes. We want to be with loved ones, yes. But we're also creatures of God says, you do well, then you're going to be rewarded. The Apostle Paul is talking about rewards. You stay faithful to the Lord, guess what? It's going to increase to your account. Talking about heavenly rewards. Uh, well, I want it right now. And that's the problem, right? We demand that it happens right now in this lifetime. No, the Apostle Paul, I know there's some great motivation deep within you. You stay faithful to the work of God. It's going to increase to your account. That's number one. It pays off to be faithful to the work of God, to work with a team. But then in verse 18, but I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. Uh, in other words, I'm fully supported by you. What you have done has succeeded in fully supporting me. You see? You've been effective. And in that being effective, the third thing is, look at what it says, very, very important, the last part. Um, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. A frag uh, fragrant aroma. Turn to that old, old book, the book of Leviticus. I know you might have to say, take the dust out of there, right? Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus chapter 2. And there, uh, the second uh, offering, sacrifice that was being described that the Israel was supposed to bring. And that sacrifice was to show a dedication and devotion to God. The grain offering. Okay, it's kind of complicated. If you want to, you can go to the website. You can listen to the whole sermon on this uh, chapter. But it, it was a, a, an offering to say, God, you've been so good to me. I want to dedicate my life to you, and I want to give the best to you. That's the, that's the sense of this sacrifice. And I want you to know, uh, Leviticus chapter 2, verse 1. Now, when it, any person, any person, man or woman, any person, anyone presents a, a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and you shall pour oil on it and frankincense on it. Fine flour. And by the way, fine flour, if you read it, in, read the whole chapter when you have a chance, it's repeated five or six times. What's the point of fine flour? You present the absolute best to God. You present the absolute best to God. That's what it means. And you, you, and, and you put oil. Uh, you make sure that it's right. You see? And then frankincense, something that smells really, really good, like incense. Wow. Jump down to uh, verse 9 of Leviticus chapter 2. The priest uh, shall take up from the grain offering its memorial portion and shall offer it up in smoke on the altar as an offering by fire, of soothing aroma to the Lord. This grain is accepted by God. Ah, it's well-pleasing to God. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 4. You see? This sacrifice, this thing that you do to help the church, to be a part of the gospel work, man, it's well-pleasing to God. God accepts it, and he's pleased with that. Your faithfulness, Philippians, uh, not only is that into your account, not only is it providing for me support, but it's also well-pleasing to God. It smells great. You see. Now all of this, all of this, he says, now he finishes in um, Philippians chapter 4. It needs to be God-centered. 
It needs to be God-centered because if it's not God-centered, you know what happens? It becomes me-centered. Am I getting fulfilled? Do I have fun? Do I feel good about doing this? You see? It becomes about us. And the apostle says, no, 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 no. Be careful, careful. It needs to be God-centered. Verse 19. And my God, my God, it's not your abilities. God uses your abilities, but it's not your, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Well, what are God's riches? Uh, all the Lowe's in the world? All the Home Depot's? All the Walmart's? All the restaurants of the whole world? All the billionaires of the world? Belong to God. All of it. According to his riches. You think he's going to run out of money to support you? Don't think so. It is God, it is God, it is God who is going to supply your needs. And why? Verse 20. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And we could stay there a long time. God's glory. He's the creator. He's our savior. He's patient. He's loving. He's holy. He's just. He sympathizes with us. He gives us everything we need. He gave us his only begotten son. He gave us his word. He gave us his church. He gives us everything we need. He is most glorious. He is most glorious. The moment we start looking away from the glory of God, we start looking at self or other people, it's only going to take us down the wrong path. It needs to be God-centered. And that's why as a church you say, what are we to be about? Glorifying God by helping people out of darkness? You see? And we need to be working together, working together. So then... Where do we begin to apply it? Well, <clears throat> let's start first of all that we need to trust God. Right? Trust God. The whole Levitical system, the sabbatical system, that they had to work six days, and the seventh day they couldn't work. They were not allowed to work. It's a Sabbath unto the Lord. And then they had other Sabbaths where they had to give the land back. They had other Sabbaths where they had to forgive all the debt. I mean, they had, <clears throat> and what does that mean? Well, they had to trust God. They had to trust God that, they were, that God was going to provide. You see? And so that's where we need to begin. To trust that God will supply your physical, emotional, spiritual needs as you give to the Lord. So give, support living word or the church in full trust that God is going to supply all your needs. But um, you need to remember that supplying and giving to the church is not about that. It's about this is what brings glory to God. This is what keeps the, the ministry going that God is doing, you see? Because if we just focus on, oh, I gotta give, oh, I gotta give, oh, I gotta give. Well, you know, we stay stuck in that and we don't look at the bigger picture. It's about glorifying God and it's about getting to know him. You know, again, we go to the Sabbath in the Old Testament and the people had to trust that God was going to supply. It's like, is he going to supply? Maybe not. Uh, is he going to supply? And then God would supply. It's like, I guess he keeps his word. <laughs> I guess God is faithful. God is all powerful. You see, they, got, they, they, they could get to know him personally, not just intellectually. But as they trusted God to supply, and he did, it's like, wow, God is faithful. God is all powerful. God really does care for me. And that's the point, you see. So, trusting God. Um, something very similar is not just trusting God, but honoring God. Honoring God. Now, <clears throat> I've already said it, that we need to focus on the glory of God, but look at children. When you honor your parents, you're honoring yourself. When you're dishonoring your parents, you're dishonoring yourself. It's very simple to know. 
when somebody at school puts your mother down, why does it hurt? They're putting you down, right? We need to honor God. As we honor God, we end up honoring ourselves, you see? As we give to the work of God, as we honor Him with all that we have, you see? And and it goes down the line, whether it's uh, parents, spouses. Listen, you dishonor your spouse, you're dishonoring yourself. You honor your spouse, you're honoring yourself. I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, We can stay a long time there. Uh, I want you just to, uh, the greatest glorification that God is glorious is what? The gospel, right? Because that's the greatest work. Uh, In fact, in John 17, John 17, I'm almost done, take it easy. John 17, uh, verse 1. Right? This is, the, this is the Lord's prayer. This is right before he got crucified. And I want you to note, John 17, verse 1. This is right before he got crucified. He knew he'd been rejected and he was going to go to the cross. John 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these things, lifting up his eyes to heaven. Now he's talking to God the Father directly. He said, Father, the hour has come. Okay, Father, it's time for nails to go through my hands. And my feet. It's time for me to get crucified. And what does he say next? Glorify the Son, that the Son may glorify you. You know, when a woman has a baby, she's glorious. She's glorious. When a man fights against evil and he really fights against evil and he stands strong in the Lord he's glorious Jesus says I've come to die on the cross okay dad let's get it on glorify the son that the son may glorify you it's the glory of God the gospel, you see. And because we are committed to glorifying God by spreading the gospel, by telling others, you see, that's why we say, give to the church. Commit to the kingdom of God. Because this is glorifying God the Father. And if we glorify God the Father, we end up getting glorified ourselves. Jesus said, glorify the Son, that the Son may glorify you. That's why we give. Finally, uh, we need to stay faithful. Verse 14, you've done well, Philippians. Philippians 4, verse 14. Stay faithful or, or listen, or become faithful givers. Uh, In John I'm telling you, okay, this is the last one. John 4, the Gospel of John, verse 4. I promise you, well, I can't, pro- yes, I will promise that. John 4, verse 36. Uh, this is when Jesus was talking with the woman at the well. Uh, he led her to, the, to, to, to salvation. She went to the town. And they were bringing the mob back. And the disciples came. He's like, man, who brought him something to eat and whatever? And they didn't know. And Jesus says, you know, I'll, my food is to do the will of my father. Right? And then he goes and tells them, verse 36. Now he's telling the disciples already, he who reaps, and he had just told them, go witness to them, uh, reaps is receiving wages, and he who gathers fruit for eternal life. So that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and the other reaps. So you need to stay faithful. We're not all the same, right? I'm called to be up here and yell and scream. You're not. Uh, We all have different parts. But we all need to contribute. We all need to contribute, stay faithful, or become faithful to giving and supporting this ministry, Living Word. And if not, wherever you go to church, commit to be faithful and give to what? 
to gospel work, teamwork. To gospel work, working together. Because this is God's agency. This is not my idea. It's God's idea, the church. Will you? Will you stay faithful or begin to be faithful to give to the Lord? Your choice. I don't need to know whether you give or not. I don't need to know how much you give. It's between you and the Lord. But I'm asking you, look at the Word of God and commit to faithfully giving, being a partner in what God is doing. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you, our Father, that you love us. Thank you that you're so patient with us. That you give us these opportunities to serve you, Lord, and to give. Oh, God, help us see, Lord. Help us see. Some of us are so blind. We don't... Uh, you don't want us to give out of guilt, Lord. No. You want us to give out of love because of your great name. Be with us, Father. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.